So it's all part of that. move on. But we have the uh, youth with us tonight because uh, as I was uh, meeting with the youth leaders, um, I, where we're at in our study, it's uh, what does it mean to become a Christian? So we're talking, and there's a, it, frankly, there's a lot of confusion out there. What what's actually are the steps required to become a Christian and when you know you're a Christian? So we just uh, have invited the youth to come up and participate in our study tonight and do all of that, and then they'll head back down to their room uh, when we're done with that. So, Greg? All right. All right, the song we're going to sing tonight, we're just going to do a couple of verses. It's number 311. 311. Last week, this week, and I guess next week, too, up until Easter, we'll do some songs that have an Easter theme to them. 311. Hallelujah, what a Savior. This Sunday, in addition to um, uh, sermon and the regular worship uh, that we have, uh, Judy Selenga is coming at, and she's going to share at the end of the service. Uh, she's been back and forth in Africa. She's now here studying at one of our seminaries. And so uh, she has asked to come and share a little bit about what's going on. So she'll be doing that at the end of the service after uh, everything else. So um, that's, we've got that. Uh, going uh, and then uh, the choir program the following Sunday uh, and then Easter Sunday uh, we will have the uh, sunrise service at Filbert PCA at 7 a.m. so a, a busy uh, next three Sundays so so tonight we're gonna uh, talk about what it is to become a, a Christian and um, I have to tell people that 
Christian is a bad word, that you shouldn't call yourself a Christian. And I don't. Why do you think I say that you shouldn't call yourself a Christian? Uh, that, that could be true. He said um, I, people might think you're a hypocrite because they know you, right? Oh, he says he's a Christian. Uh, uh, no, I mean, yes, that, that, that's kind of a, a, a glass half empty example, but true. Uh, why do you think calling yourself a Christian is not necessarily a good thing? Because what? No, um, that's true, but that's not why. Yes? No, um, I, let me tell you why. Because for non-Christians, especially in the Bible Belt, it means I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a Catholic, I'm not a Hindu, I'm not an atheist. If you were to ask people, and as a general rule, are you a Christian, they would tell you yes. Because they see themselves as cultural Christians, as people that maybe go to a church. But their church may not preach the gospel at all. And they just see themselves as a Christian. In other words, in the international scheme in the world, we're still kind of known as what kind of a nation? A Christian nation, right? We're not Muslim we're a nation. We're not Hindu like India. We're not Muslim like Arab uh, countries are. We are seen as a Christian nation. And those of us that are practicing Christians, would we call America a Christian nation? No. We're far from that, and we never really were, but we had Judeo-Christian ethics and morals that have imbued ourselves in our country. So, is it wrong to call yourself a Christian? No. But how many of you have heard of some Hollywood actor that calls themselves a Christian? And then you watch one of their movies, or hear that they got divorced and walked out on their spouse and everything else, and you go, I thought they were a what? A Christian. And so, or, or, so we have to be careful that the world doesn't hold Christian with the same definition that we do. So um, it, it literally means in the first century church a Christ follower. That would be a better term. I'm a Christ follower. And in a theological sense, you are born again. But most people, if you said, what are you? Oh, I'm born again. They would go, what does that mean? Just like Nicodemus did in the dark with Jesus in John chapter 3. And so tonight we're going to unpack this idea of, of what it means to be a Christian and how we get there. So, um, it, it, and we're going to talk about some differences in Christian theology tonight. Not do a deep dive, but part of the confusion is is other Christian faiths, their definition of being a Christian is different than maybe what the Bible teaches, or we have uh, some ordering things in the sense of what takes place. So, turn to Romans chapter 3. And here's going to be the first shocker of the night. Romans chapter 3, uh, and I'll start reading in verse 10. Romans 3, verses 10 through 12. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. I think we all agree with that, that we're all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. It's this next phrase. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This phrase, no one seeks for God, has caused more confusion in the church because most church evangelism programs think what? That if we invite them to church, if we have some event, if we woo them, they will come to God. And so we create these programs in the church thinking that people will come to God. And theologically, that is wrong, and that is why the church in America has gotten weak, because we have to go where? To the world. 
And the Bible's very clear. They're not coming. They don't wake up on Sunday and go, I wonder if I go to Union Baptist Church whether I'll sense God's presence today. No. There's not. No one. And so in the 80s and 90s, we had a thing called seeker services. And a whole church movement was born on putting food courts in your church and having all kinds of events and church, big mega churches were built and, and children's departments. I've been to these churches where it looks like Noah's Ark and, and everything else because we want to what? Bring them in. Woo them in. Now, there's something for having a pleasing environment and being pleasing people, but we need to understand that evangelism is not on Sunday morning. It's not my job to save people on Sunday morning. It's our job to go out in the week and do that. John chapter 6, verse 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So even Jesus said, when he was here, said, I, It ain't me. I'm the agent of salvation, but I'm not the, the motivation and the means for this. That's why he spent three years training his disciples to go out. And so that's the first thing we need to unpack is in the sense of... Um, Can they see what's happening on the camera? Okay, good. You took it off of me? So. Uh, <laughs> so for those of you at home, uh, we've been blessed tonight with the presence of the Alts and Debbie after undergoing some serious surgery and having that ahead of her. And so uh, it's good to see you guys here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So. So this kind of calling, to go back to this, is of the king himself. Father God draws people to him. Um, and it's, it's something that we don't quite understand. That's why it's our missionaries have to go out. That's why when we go on mission trips, we have to go out. And so we tend to think that if we design our church and we make it there and everything else, so uh, the purpose of... Sunday morning is not evangelism. There's a lot of you that have come to me and said, how come you don't do altar calls? Because that's not what Sunday morning is about. What's Sunday morning about? Worship. Worship of the king. And so I'm not saying it's inappropriate to, to have an invitation. I do that occasionally if the passage bears that in mind. But, but Sunday morning is us, the believers, the Christians, coming to church and worshiping God the Father. And there's only two responses that should happen on Sunday morning. If you're a believer, you should be here offering your worship to God. If you're an unsaved person and you are sitting in our midst during our worship, you should say, I want to be a part of that. There's something going on here. Every person that saw God in person basically said the same thing Isaiah said is, woe is me, I am undone. I was reading about uh, in, in through uh, the judges, and there was uh, a family that entertained the angel of the Lord, uh, Theophany, uh, and, and at the very end, they realized that they had entertained and fed and provided hospitality to God himself in person, a Theophany. And they panicked, and they looked at each other and said, we are dead men walking. I'm paraphrasing. Because they said, we have been in the presence of God. And so they immediately went out and offered that. So, that's the first thing we need to understand. That evangelism can take place here, but the church is for equipping and worshiping, not evangelism. It's to equip us to go out. So, what does that mean? There's a thing called the calling. And that's our responsibility. We have the responsibility of helping people find the way. They'll sense in their heart 
that they need to be saved. They, they're under conviction, but they don't know how to get from where they're at, buried deep in their sin, to Jesus Christ. So we're roadmaps to Jesus Christ. But in order to provide that roadmap, where do we need to start at? With them out there. Not in here going, hello, hello, we're over here, we're over here, come over here. But that's what's happened to the church in America. We keep trying to wonder why they're not here on Sunday morning when actually outside of the fact that we need to be worshiping, it would be better to be out there. So we need to understand this gospel call and this uh, calling. Paul makes it clear in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, when he writes to believers that their calling from God came from our gospel. So we do have a gospel presentation. Turn to Acts chapter 16. This depicts what becoming a Christian's journey is like. And we're going to get to the actual act of salvation here, but we need to understand, we need to start where the people are at. Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Uh, the disciple Luke writes about uh, Paul and his ministry. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. Now listen to this. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So, Here's how salvation works. We have the road map. We have the knowledge of how a person gets saved. But sometimes it falls on deaf ears. Sometimes it's not responded to because God has not opened their heart yet. Where the sadness comes in is if God has opened their heart and there's nobody there with the gospel message. And that's the sadness that exists in the world today. That God, in the whole, through the Holy Spirit, can bring conviction in an unsaved person, but they have no idea. And we need to understand our country now is an unchurched country. It isn't about helping somebody get there because they're already at church. They're at home. When I met with a marketing person when I was a pastor at another church, she said the biggest challenge to the church in America is getting people to give up good things on Sunday morning to go to church when they've never done that. They sleep in. They have a nice breakfast at home. Maybe they go grocery shopping because mom was at the basketball, baseball, soccer field all day Saturday and she works and she didn't have time. So the only time she can go to the grocery store is Sunday. Dad's mowing the grass. I remember nobody mowed grass on Sunday. Now all kinds of people mow the grass on Sunday. It's the only day. Because Saturday's filled up with youth and family activities. And so they're not coming. But you have to convince somebody to change their lifestyle if you want them to come here. When that's not the first thing we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is not get them here. We're trying to get them to what? Jesus. And you don't need to bring them here to get them to Jesus. So, let's say now, for the sake of this tonight, that you understand now that, that evangelism is our part. What's our part? We hold what? The roadmap. Uh, the Bible calls it what? It's a G word. The gospel. We have the gospel. All right? And it, we have a responsibility to help people find Jesus. And so, but we got to find them where they're at, at work, in our neighborhood, in our family events, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so, once we do that, it's what the writer Luke writes, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So, we will spend a lot of time presenting the gospel to people that won't respond to it. Family members, maybe our own children that just seem hardened against the gospel. And we keep bringing them to church when what really we need to do is bring them to Jesus. And that's different than bringing them to church. Because we always say, what have we said growing up in America? Invite your 
friends and family to what? To church. Rather than sitting around the table the work, at the workplace or at school and saying, hey, have you ever met Jesus? I can help you meet him right here and now, today. But what we've done is we've subcontracted out to the pastor, hoping that the pastor will give some convicting sermon from up here, and he'll have an altar call and people will come forward, when in reality you missed that opportunity on Tuesday. When that person came to you and said, man, I'm really struggling. In school, with my relationships, I'm being bullied. Uh, I split up with my boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh, I'm having problems with my children. I'm having problems with my spouse. I'm having problems with my boss. And we don't say a word about the gospel. We just talk about church because that's safe. And sadly, there's churches all around America. We're not the only denomination that's losing churches. The Methodists are, the Lutherans are, the Presbyterians are, because people are not coming to the church. And we need to be doing a better job on that. So, there are three elements of the gospel call. When I uh, was a pastor at another church, I always did the discipleship of a believer. And what's the other word, the action word we used about when you become a Christian? You got what? Saved. And so this is how you know if somebody is what they call gospel ready. And I would sit down and they would say, oh, I want to get baptized. I go, great. And they go, I'd say, why? And they go, I got saved. And I would ask two word question. From what? And you know what? Most of the people who are eager, who'd walk the aisle, had made a confession, and said they were saved and wanted to get baptized, could not answer that question. Well, if you're saved, it means you were in peril, right? Somebody had to pull you away from danger. So what are you saved from? Huh? No. Kind of yes, but no. Yes. Huh? Yeah, your sin. And that's a hard thing to do. The result and the consequence of my sin is hell. But you have to recognize and you have to help somebody understand that salvation is about recognizing that A, I'm a sinner. With children, this is very important. And this also can be with, with older people. Kids will recognize sin, much like adults do, in other people before they recognize it in themselves. A child in third grade will be a tattletale. Yeah, but, you know, did you see this so-and-so? They, they were talking. They didn't do that. Well, so were you. Uh-uh. They'll deny it right to your face, right? And most adults are just a little more sophisticated in that. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And so what they do is they, they, they elevate their sins to a more righteous state. But what you have to help people understand is you are a sinner. And you need to be saved from that. Because it's not hell that makes my life miserable. What makes my life miserable? My sin, right? I lust after things, I, I cheat, I lie, I bully people, I don't treat them fairly, uh, I show favoritism, uh, I disrespect people. Uh, that's what makes my life miserable. So even though hell is the ultimate consequence of that, I don't walk around every day going, who, do you feel hot? Ah, am I getting close to hell? No. What makes our life miserable is the sin that we commit. And that's what we need to be saved from, our sin. So that's step number one, having somebody understand their sin. Number two is that they need to understand that there is only one way to be saved. Because the world and other religions will tell you that there are many paths to salvation. And so that's the second thing. 
If I'm a weak, a bad swimmer, and I jump into the, the, the deep end of the pool, I, I, I'm ready to take the life preserver, aren't I? <laughs> save me, save me, save me. The problem is, if you're kind of a good person, i.e. a good swimmer, and you jump into the pool, what do you say? Yeah, I, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, if you're a DNR agent, you see this all the time with boaters. Uh, you should be wearing a life jacket. I'm good. You know, we have a law, it's in the boat, well, it's close. If I really get into a jam, if something happens, hopefully I'll come bubbling to the surface and I'll see my life jacket and I'll swim over to it and put it on. Rarely do you see somebody fastidiously put their life jacket on, right? And, and get in there and, and, and do that. Because most people think that they got it, that they can overcome sin, that sin's not something that bad. Until it is. So, recognition of sin and then the need to be saved from it. That, Ava, Ava, right, sometimes is when we have the hell discussion as a consequence of unforgiven sin of, of all of that. But none of us worry about hell every day, on any day. That's saved for pastors in the emergency room. Sadly. So, um, but you know what? I, I, and, and, and we can tell them, well, Jesus Christ paid the price and did all that. And the problem is, when you tell people, the majority of people will say what? I'm good. I'm good. That ah, church isn't for me. Bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> okay, whatever it is. Uh, you know, I grew up in church, but it, it just, you know... When I became an adult and moved away from home, I just, I, I just didn't see any need for it. Well, I married some gal, and she's a blankety-blank. No, I don't. Ooh, I better correct that. She's a, of a different religion. I don't want you to go say that the preacher said the spouse is a blankety-blank and fill it in. But, uh, and, and so we haven't decided which faith to be yet. We're waiting until we have kids, and then we'll decide, and then we'll... Uh, oh, we're going to let the kids decide what they want to be. I hear this more than I, I, I want to. So the very salvation of your child is left to their decision. If you don't want to go to church, that's fine. Uh, I was not going to have die while my kids were still under my roof and I get to heaven and God says, you let them stay home? What were you thinking? It's not because church is a good thing. It's because that's where they're going to hear what? The gospel. So, we have the elements of the call, and it's difficult. Because we have grown up in a society where it says, I'm not allowed to tell you you're what? A sinner. That's verboten. We just don't do that. I don't walk up to you and go, whew. You wretched sinner. Just, we don't do that. Well, then how do you get them to recognize their sin? How do you get them to get to that spot? It's difficult. And that's why we work in conjunction with God. So, here's the problem we have with salvation. We love, oh, I should have brought one up with me. I, I use them. We all have carry, oh. I carry a track with me, all right? So I can whip that baby out and I go, okay, here, we're gonna read through this thing. I'm gonna show you, oh, I got some highlighted stuff. It's got eight different sections in it and I'm gonna walk you through all of this and everything else and uh, it, it's, it's like, I even got a one and a two and a three that I added to this on the back because we've been conditioned in the church in America that accepting Jesus Christ is a three-step process, a five-step process, a seven-step process. It's, it's understanding all of this. Uh, most people don't like to read. You know what? The 85% of Americans operate as functional illiterates. Do you know that? <laughs> I didn't ask how many were. 
okay? But what that means is we don't like to read. We like pictures. We like 15-minute, 15 15-second 15 TikToks that have slammed my Facebook page, and they're calling it Reels, and I'm, I'm tired of watching 15 seconds, and then it stops in the middle of the story. I'm like, but, but we, we take life in these little sound bites and these little pictures and, and memes. And if I see another picture of Will Smith slapping uh, Chris Rock, I think I'm going to die here. You know, enough already. Eh? But that's what the life we live in, is it not? How we get little snippets of, of, of stuff. And so a track like this worked at one time. And, and so who's that track for? Why do I carry it around? If I just beat the track up, why do I carry it around? Because I don't remember. It's a resource for me, not something I hand to somebody and say, read this and get back with me. We don't do that. We're functionally illiterate in our country. So you have to walk people through that. So how many steps are there to salvation? And what's that? All right, to believe. All right, I'll give you fifty percent for that question. There's one step, not three. No. Nope. Uh, that's a nice Christian term. We have all kinds of Christian terms for these, these, what I'm saying is the half. We tell people that they need to be born again. John, Jesus told that to Nicodemus, did he not? Born again, all right? But Nicodemus was a theologian, all right? That's he, he could understand, and, but even he didn't. He said, how can I be what? Born again and go back into my mom and do all that. We say, accept Jesus Christ into your heart. Never say that with children because they're literalist and they will try to wonder how a man uh, that they just saw in their Sunday school book is going to get in their heart. Uh, but that, is that not our terminology? Accept Jesus Christ into your heart. All right. We're going to be born again. Um, we have faith and belief. Now the problem is those are two separate things. If you were to ask in most Christians they believe in Jesus Christ. Who else also believed in Jesus Christ? Demons. Demons. Satan. In other words, that's just agreeing to the fact that he exists. And so we have to go past that word of believe. And so turn to Acts chapter 16. Because we need to understand two principles here. First off, they have to have an understanding and be gospel ready that they're a sinner in need of salvation. Sinner needing to be saved. Sinner needing to be saved. And a better argument is not from hell, but from what? The daily consequences of your sins. And it's much easier for me to talk to somebody and go, does sin affect your life? Do you lie? Do you cheat? Do you cut the corners? Do you speed on your way to work? You can get people to do that, right? But when you say, do you want to be saved from hell, a lot of people say, I don't believe in hell. But they believe in the consequences of what's taking place in their life for bad decisions. So we need to get personal and get close with people. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. This is the story of the Philippian jailer where Paul was uh, released and, and saved and they came out of the prison and the Philippian jailer threw himself down in front of them because he knew his life would be taken because of the escaped prisoners and Paul said, don't worry, everybody's here, no one's escaped. And the, the, the jail keeper took Paul and Silas to his, his house and then he said, then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, I just got finished saying believe is, is, is a problematic word. 
because we believe in a lot of things that we don't really believe the same way. So here's the story that I tell. I was an army paratrooper. 100 jumps, night jumps, all kinds of crazy stuff loaded up with combat gear. And I always had maybe 150 pounds strapped onto me of combat gear, and I had a parachute on the back. But they always gave me what they called a reserve parachute that was on the front of me. And what was the reserve parachute there for? In case the big one didn't open up. Now, I, I didn't pack the big one. It was packed by somebody maybe weeks or months before. It was some private that packed that chute that I was going to put on and strap it on and go flying out of an airplane going 150, 160 miles an hour and jump out in the middle of the night uh, into a, an area I didn't know where I was at and float down to the earth. And not once did I say, I'm good, I don't want the reserve. Because, see, I didn't believe that that chute was packed good enough to save my life. I wanted an insurance policy. Sadly, that's the way the world operates in salvation. There are faiths that believe that you will go to a place in between heaven and hell to work off your sins. There are others that believe that your good works count towards your salvation. People will tell you, I'm not good enough to be saved. God doesn't like the things that I do. No, he doesn't. But basically, you have to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient, the key word, in itself to not. So the hardest people for me to bring salvation to are good Catholics. Good Catholics that go to Mass, that go to confession, that, uh, that uh, get their uh, everything else, but they have some flaws in their theology that holds that they're not really saved because a good Catholic, when they're dying, wants a priest to do what? Anybody know? Last rites. Last rites. Because they don't think that their salvation is good enough. And they're concerned that if they're going to die and the priest doesn't come and give them their last rites, they're not going to make it. And so the priest giving last rites is what to them? The reserve parachute. And so I ask them, would you be willing to forego the, the priest? Mm, I don't know. Then you're not saved. That's what Martin Luther said. He said the Catholic Church has added stuff to the faith. It is stripped away, and he said it's faith and faith alone that saves a person. And so we've got to get to that spot where we say, I'm there. So there's only one step to salvation. We have to recognize intellectually and in our hearts that we're sinners. But that's not salvation. People can admit that they're bad people, right? You see that all the time in court cases, right? They apologize to the family. I'm sorry I murdered your, your family member. I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I drove drunk and, and slammed into you know, your car and now you're a paraplegic. Uh, people feel bad about their sins all the time. What they don't feel is that need for salvation from it. And so that's the first step, being gospel ready. Second thing is providing them the road map. So when someone says to you, well, what do I have to do to be saved? Uh, we want to whip out the sinner's prayer. Now, some of our brothers in Christianity believe that there's an extra step, what we Baptists call an extra step to salvation. And maybe some Baptists people would believe it too. And it's an R word. It's repent and be saved. Does anybody know what the word repent means? Huh? Turn away from your sin. Right. That's the, the, the literal definition for that. And so we hold that, oh, you've got to repent and be saved. I say you need to repentance leading unto salvation. In other words, there has to be a willingness to give up the sin. Make sure you don't confuse that repentance. Because if I'm caught in a deep addiction, and I'm trapped in it, and you tell me I have to repent before I can become saved, what have you done? You've placed perhaps an insurmountable obstacle in front of me. 
that I don't think I can overcome. Oh, I've tried to beat this addiction. I've been in rehab. I've, been, I've had relapses. I've tried the 12 steps. They don't work. Well, they don't work because you're not saved and you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. But when we say you need to repent, we've created a precondition to salvation. And we need to be very careful. And you'll hear people say, repent and be saved. I'm not saying that's wrong in its entirety, but don't place that obstacle in front of people. It's not biblical. It's not a prerequisite to salvation because repentance, the power of repentance comes after salvation, not before. And so, where are we finished with this? Ava was right. Romans 6.23 tells us, uh, for the wages of sin is death. But it also says the free gift of God is eternal life. John 3.16 tells us because of his love for us, he died in our place. And so what we need to tell people is you can stop worrying about the punishment. The punishment, the ultimate punishment, hell, but also the punishment. It doesn't mean you're not going to go to jail for doing something wrong, but that spiritual, that cosmic, that eternal punishment has been taken away. Jesus Christ is the only one that can do that. God promises forgiveness of sins and eternal life in heaven to all who receive by grace through faith Jesus Christ as their Savior. So, to, to go on what Blanche said, when I believe in Jesus Christ, what, does, what do I have to believe? No. Not yet. So you just book ended this. No. Huh? Ah, that's a dangerous thing. That's like either scaring them out of hell or giving them the promise of 72 virgins. I know that's not true, but you gotta be, we got to be careful of all that. Because there are other faiths that go, you want 72 virgins? Or do you want to go to heaven and work? Uh, I'll take the virgins. You've know, it, it's, it's, you got to be careful of all of that because people have their own construction of what heaven is. What do you have to believe? Ah, say it louder. Yes, you have to believe that Jesus Christ alone can save you from your sins. No work of your own, no process, no steps, no belief in him as an individual or anything else. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is your way for salvation. Jesus Christ alone. And so that's the difficult thing. And so if you're a Catholic and you're a good Catholic, it's hard because you've got to give up all these things that you were taught going to confession through a priest, an intermediary, praying to whom? Mary. No, no. And see, we have encumbered all these other Christian faiths. That's where, see how I've circled back into that? That this is an idea of this. So salvation is not about certain steps we must follow to earn salvation. Yes, Christians should be baptized. Yes, Christians should publicly confess Christ is Savior. Yes, Christians should turn from sin, repentance. Yes, Christians should commit their lives to obeying God. However, these are not steps to salvation. They are results of salvation. Now I'm going to kill one more sacred cow. You ready? Light the fire, get the tar bubbling, start plucking some feathers. Coming forward on Sunday morning is not a part of salvation. If you tell somebody that they got saved and they got to come forward the next Sunday, you have placed an obstacle to their salvation in front of them. Not once in the Bible did Jesus or a disciple drag the person out of their home, off the road, out of their chariot, and drag them to some church somewhere and say, now you're saved. But we have a tradition in our Southern Baptist culture and in many Baptist cultures of doing what? 
the altar call where they come forward. And that's a big ask. A big ask. And it becomes a hindrance. If you lead somebody to the Lord, what's the next thing you encourage them to do? Yes. Huh? Well, that's, you've, you've led somebody. You're the road map. You got them there. They said, I, I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way I can get saved. You pray with them. They, they say this out loud. What's the first thing you should ask them to do? Make it public. But that can be what to a child? Tell your parents. Not the church. If I'm deep in an addiction and I'm struggling with it and I get saved because I'm like the prodigal son and I do that, I'm not ready to show my face in front of anybody. Not necessarily. Because some people will not have assurance of salvation. So, Naaman comes down and uh, he's got leprosy and he visits Elisha. And he says, what do I do? And Elisha says, go to the River Jordan and dip yourself seven times. Naaman goes, hey, no way. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not going to do it. That Jordan River is dirty and all the rivers in Syria are much cleaner. And his servants go, you stupid idiot. You brought all this stuff and money and clothes to, to give to the prophet. And he just told you to do this and you won't do this when you were ready to give away all of this. Just do it. And so he went and he was healed. And he came back. And here's the part of the story that's in the scripture that isn't preached a lot. After he confessed and he acknowledged it. We don't know if he's saved. The Bible is not directly in that. But he got real close. He said, look, I'm heading back to my homeland. And it's a pagan homeland. And I'm the bodyguard of the king. And he goes to his temple, his church every day. And I'm supposed to go and be with him. And uh, what should I do? And that's a new Christian says, I- I'm trapped in this sin. I cheat. I'm maybe having an affair with my wife right now. Uh, what do I do? I- I- how do I- I- am I not saved till I stop that? And this is what Elisha said. Does anybody know what Elisha said to Naaman? He said, go in peace. You see, that's what we've just brought them to, have we not? The peace of salvation. Now, he didn't say, it's okay, don't worry about it. It, it, uh, He just said, look, it, it, it'll come. It'll come. Because some of us will struggle with maybe that sin that brought us to salvation, even after salvation, right? I don't give up every vice I had before I got saved just because I got saved. Some of us may have worldly consequences. Uh, a criminal case, uh, something we did, uh, a divorce that's wrecked our family, whatever it is, and, and we got to pay that consequence. Salvation doesn't remove that, does it? No. But it can give you peace. It can give you peace. So, encourage them to tell somebody. But I'm not looking for them next Sunday to come down here. If they want to, that's fine. That's great. But a lot of times what happens is, especially with younger kids, kids and teenagers, they'll get saved, and then all of a sudden there's this pressure on them to do what? To get baptized and to to come forward in front of the church and everything else. And what they're looking for is just assurance that they made the right decision. And they want someone to pull alongside them and say, that's great. Can I pray for you? Can I disciple you? Can I teach you about assurance of salvation? How you're not going to lose it once you get it that you don't have to doubt. Sometimes uh, we can close the gap and, and baptize people real quick. Sometimes we, we don't. Uh, Priscilla's working with a kid downstairs right now. Young, I think he's seven. Just turned eight. I don't want to rush him up there because I don't want him to be 18 and saying, well, I remember I got baptized in my church, but I don't understand what it was, what it's about. So Priscilla's deliberately week by week by week is taking this young man through this. He'll get baptized and he'll do it when he's ready to make that. But why would I drag an eight-year-old up here in front of everybody? 
He might go through it just to please grandma or the preacher to get the preacher off his back. But I want a young man that says, I'm ready. Let me get baptized now. This is for me. That's what I want to do. So be careful of some of our traditions. Uh, the Catholics aren't the only one that place encumbrances in front of people that get saved. And so, yes? Right, and so the Catholic Church holds that infant baptism, which is different than how the Presbyterians practice infant baptism, but yes, they seal it unto, to salvation and do that. We believe that infants are not held accountable for their sins. It's called the age of accountability. That's for another time, uh, but it has nothing to do whether they got baptized or, or not. And just to make that distinction, the Catholic baptism of infants is different than the Presbyterian baptism of infants. So if, if someone says they're born again, but they haven't been baptized, is there any connection? I mean, if they say they're born again, should they be baptized? Yeah, it, um, I, it, it's part of our requirement for membership. So the, the, he asked the question, I've been told to do this because the people that are watching at home can't hear the question. But uh, Ken asked if, if someone says they're saved but they haven't been baptized, what do you do? Well, you put a horse collar on them, you drag them here, and then in that case, you do drag them down here. And uh, no, um, I've rebaptized people second time. And so baptism is not just this super sealing sort of thing. It has nothing to do with your assurance of salvation. So what is baptism? It's your opportunity to, in a larger group of believers, say, I hold these things to be true. Because what does the preacher do when someone is getting baptized? And what are the questions? Are you a sinner? Do you recognize yourself as a sinner in need of salvation? Uh, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And yes, and, and then you say, because of your profession of faith, I'm now going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so part of that is, is getting them to walk back through that. I was a sinner in need of salvation. That's not salvation now. That's just gospel-ready stuff. And then it is, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my one and only Savior from my sin. It had nothing to do with, well, and we're not here to talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit and all that other stuff. Uh, next week, we're talking about sanctification and all that stuff. But um, most of the time, why do we Baptists require Presbyterians to get baptized? Huh? <laughs> you were probably baptized as an infant in the Presbyterian Church. That is not what we call salvation baptism. And the Bible holds that everybody got baptized after they got saved, not before. And so there's nothing wrong with you doing that. We don't practice infant baptism. What is our correlation to infant baptism? We do something. Dedication. Yeah, baby dedication. We seal them in the covenant family to be raised in a, fa a Christian family and do all that. The Be Presbyterian Church goes one step further and baptizing the child into the covenant family, which is different than sealing the child's salvation, which is not biblical, it's through baptism. So, uh, but yes, we want that public uh, thing. Uh, my son was baptized as a Baptist and went to an independent fundamental Bible church, and they go, that ain't good enough, and then they dunked him again. And uh, he said, well, whatever. Uh, this is my deaf son. He didn't understand, and we went to a Presbyterian church for a while, for a couple of years, and we took him up to the, to the baptism thing and opened the lid, and it's just a little 
thing where the, uh, the minister gets in there and, yeah, and he said, how do you get in there? <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we are ruined by church in that way, are we not? Where in his mind, it's immersion, baby, you got to go under. And, and, and even I, I tell this funny story, I baptized a really big guy, a big, big guy. And I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to get him back up once I got him down. Well, he was so buoyant, he wouldn't go under. He just kind of was laying there on his back. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. Because there's some hardcore Baptists out there that are going to say, he didn't go all the way under. I didn't feel like grabbing his head, so I, you know, it was a little bit below. I'm like splashing water on top of his head to get his face wet, you know? I, it's crazy stuff. And I, and I tell the story, and I have permission with Priscilla, but my daughter-in-law got saved and got baptized in her church. And you know who baptized her? The person that led her to the Lord. And when Priscilla saw that happen, she leaned over to me and goes, Is that legal? Why? Because what have we been led to believe? Yeah, it has to be a, that, and that's not in the Bible. But yet, so this was a celebration of her neighbor who led her to the Lord and did all of that and was going to be a part of that. Now, for Priscilla's sake, they had a minister standing by the pool just so he could, like, you know, be a, you know, the official guy there. But no, what a wonderful celebration, right, of baptism. The person that led you to the Lord is going to be a part of your public profession of that. And so um, uh, we have glommed on a lot of stuff, have we not, to salvation. So I promised the youth they'd be out of here 25 minutes ago, but good conversation, good understanding of all this. So in review... Gospel ready, what do they need to recognize? That they're a sinner, that they are a sinner, and that there are consequences for their sins. All right? And you don't use always the eternal consequences. You use what? You can just use life consequences, right? How's your life going? Well, not too good. Well, sin. All right? If they go, what must I do to be saved, what do you say? There you go, there you go, all right? There's nothing wrong with confessing your sins, you know, and, and, and doing that. But what we really want is a confession that they're a sinner, not a confession of their sins. And that's all part of the pre-gospel stuff, all right? But then they accept Jesus Christ as the only salvation for their sins, the, as, as their Savior, all right? That's the act of salvation. At that moment, you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, regeneration, sanctification, a whole bunch of technical theological stuff takes place. And then after that, we practice in the Baptist church, what? Baptism by immersion. And that is a public recognition of that. Do we in adults like to close that gap? Yes. You know, but children, we kind of spread it out a little bit. Because well, I can bat we can have an altar call at the end of VBS and baptize that kid on Sunday, and he may have no idea why he got baptized. He was just told to come back on Sunday and get baptized. And most of the adults that I rebaptized were exactly those kids. They got saved as a little kid at VBS and got baptized the following Sunday, or even that last night, and they had no idea, because no one discipled them. And that's why we think it's important to do that. Good conversation. I didn't know how long it would last, but it's important for us. So, where's the gospel got to be? Out there, all right? No one comes to us. We can't woo anybody. So stop saying, I think you'd really like our pastor. Uh, maybe that would be okay <laughs> if you said that once in a while. But uh, it's not my magical words that save anybody. My persuasion... None of that. Or yours, for that matter. It's someone realizing that they're a sinner and they need to be saved. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful, uh, although a long study. We pray if there's anybody here that was recently saved, uh, that uh, they will leave here with assurance that what they did uh, is real and meaningful and sufficient because there's nothing extra they need to do other than accept your Son as their one and only Savior. 
We know, though, that uh, Satan will immediately attack people like this and cast doubt into their lives and, and make them wonder whether they got saved or whether there's more to it. Uh, give them peace tonight that there isn't. But at the same time, God, we pray that they will be bold in their acknowledgement of this, that they will tell people that this is what has happened to them and that is why they are going to be different. But give them peace as Elisha gave Naaman peace. Not peace to continue in their sin, but peace to begin the journey of traveling out of that sin. God, uh, there may be even people here tonight that haven't accepted you as their savior because they're not gospel ready. Uh, they enjoy the sins that they commit and they haven't suffered a serious enough consequence yet to be convicted of that. We pray and keep them out of harm's way, but not out of harm's way that leads to salvation. So we pray that you will continue your work, your work, in bringing them to you. May we be ready with a quick answer just like Paul and Silas were with the Philippian jailer. So we thank you that faith in you is difficult but simple. It's not complicated, but it does take a recognition in our own life of our shortcoming. We pray for that. We pray for our family members that aren't saved. We pray for our children that aren't saved. We pray for our neighbors that aren't saved, our co-workers that aren't saved. May we be ready with a gospel map at all times to lead them to Jesus Christ when they are ready. So we pray for every relationship that everybody has here, that we will have ears to hear when someone is gospel ready. May we be quick to respond, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray all of this. Amen. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, we will um, forego the prayer sheet time. I will just share with you a couple of updates I have. Cole, will you pass those out? And when we do that, uh, I mentioned this to some people, but we are uh, a very influential church in uh, the York Baptist Association, especially in the western part. Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but we have three of our 